Good snowy morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to worship and happy Refor Reformation. We uh, celebrate a feast day today, uh, the Reformation of the church, and uh, the choir made it to the first service, and the brass did, and Jeannie did, and it was fabulous, and I think we have a few more people even for this service in the choir. And there may have been more people at early service than there are now, but kudos to you brave folks who, uh, it's not bad out there, is it? Is it slippery? Yes. Oh, Joanne says yes, and the Harkers say no, so I don't know. Difference of opinion? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so uh, it's a good day to be together, and I pray that you will be blessed by our uh, Reformation worship this day. Um, we continue Stewardship 2020, and you'll see on the front page of your bulletin, uh, this was what uh, our stewardship folks shared with us last week. Uh, they continue to uh, hope that you will pray about your response to uh, Stewardship 2020 and support the good work of this uh, pretty special congregation. So. Uh, next week is All Saints Sunday, and uh, so what, what I uh, would hope that you've already done, and if you haven't, you will do, is give us the name of a loved one that you would like for us to remember in prayer uh, next Sunday morning, and uh, we always do a very long litany at the beginning, and uh, a lot of churches just do uh, those who have died in the last year, but... Um, we shoot the moon, and it's good. Uh, we remember lots and lots of people. So, um, In two weeks, uh, we will uh, celebrate uh, the 19th annual Alternative Gift Fair. And uh, we've, we've hosted that for about nine or 10 years, I think. And uh, you know that this is about a $100,000 weekend for nonprofits. And uh, the alternative gift fair takes over the whole church except for our sanctuary. And uh, we encourage you to consider uh, buying once and gifting twice. So support that if you would. Um, uh, Rainbow Trail. Uh, November 1st is the uh, deadline. No, it begins the process of registration. So if you have a young person that uh, should go to camp or could go to camp, uh, I would invite you to hit the Rainbow Trail website and uh, register your child for this summer. And that way you'll also know the dates, so um, you'll be able to plan ahead. Um, I, th I think that's all. Uh, oh, no. So, uh, oh, this is so important. I just saw Janet Anderson. She'd kill me if I forget this. So, um, at, at the end of our service today, uh, we are going to go outside and bless the fire circle. That was uh, Curran Anderson's Eagle Scout project. And it's just a walk through the parking lot. And I was told the parking lot is not too slickery, so I think we'll be okay. But um, we'll do the service all the way through the benediction. And then those of you that would like to join us, we're going to walk down to the fire circle and bless it. And uh, there will be a drone flying overhead recording the whole thing. So that's pretty cool. So, um, But I, uh, I would invite you to join us. And then we'll have refreshments in the, uh, the uh, fellowship hall. So, OK, those of you in the back, please come on in. Uh, and I invite all of you to uh, silence your cell phones and center and quiet your hearts for worship.
Thank you. Thanks, Robin. If you are able, I invite you to stand for the invocation and the hymn of the Reformation, A Mighty Fortress. We begin our celebration of the Feast of the Reformation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort us in times of trial. Defend us against all enemies of the gospel and bestow on the church your saving grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated for the reading. The renewed covenant will not be breakable, but like the old covenant, it will expect the people to live upright lives. To know the Lord means that one will defend the cause of the poor and needy. The renewed covenant is possible only because the Lord will forgive iniquity and not remember sin. Our hope lies in a God who forgets. Our first lesson this morning is from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Word of life, excuse me, word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
Well, all the children, come on down. Let's chat a little, shall we? And we are, uh, we're going to give third graders Bibles next week because I think we only maybe have one third grader here today. Is, is there one third grader with us today? Lucy. Oh, you're a third grader. Oh, we have two out of three. They're on my desk if you want to go get them. So, all righty. How is everybody? You loving the snow? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I do too. Is that a candle on your head? Yeah, oh, it's a unicorn. Okay, I'll get with it. What a ditz I am. All righty. <laughs> okay, so I need to tell you that I have a hard time uh, not being naughty. So I have a hard time being nice all the time. I have a hard time being respectful, being loving. I have a hard time not being stingy. There's a lot of things that I do that uh, are naughty. Uh, anybody here naughty ever? Are you naughty sometimes, Lily Grace? Yeah? Okay. Anybody else? Deva says everybody is naughty, right? Everybody's naughty. And here's, here's what I need you to know. That's, that when I'm being naughty, it's hard for me to be close to God. Because my naughtiness kind of keeps me from being super, super close to God. So I want to help you understand this. So uh, uh, do you want to help me? Will you help me? Yeah. Yeah, all you have to do is stand up, and I'll I'll do this. No, no, just right here. Yeah, yeah, come on up. Yeah. All righty. I'm going to prove a point about naughtiness, and let's see if, uh, if it makes sense. So... What I need you to do is put your hands like this, okay? And come up here, take your sleeves away, okay? And uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wrap your uh, hands up uh, with this tape that says naughty on it, okay? So, so I, I put this on here to prove my point. So here's the deal. Could you, without breaking this tape, could you Fold your hands like this? Probably not. Okay. Could you dig in your purse and give somebody that needs something some money? If your purse was closed and your hands were like this and they were tied by naughtiness, could you get in there and give somebody something that they needed? Probably not. Here's the deal. When you and I are naughty, It keeps us from living and loving the way God wants us to. The only way that you and I can live life the way God wants us to is to remember Jesus' love for us that washes all our naughtiness away because he died on the cross and rose again for our sake so that our sins, our naughtiness, don't keep us from being close to God. Are you getting it? Do you get this? This is pretty important stuff in this church, that if I'm naughty, I'm not living the way God wants me to. If I'm forgiven, and if my sins are washed away in Jesus, then I can live the way God wants me to. But our naughtiness hangs us up and doesn't allow us to be the kind of people God wants us to. Okay? You get it? It's pretty easy, isn't it? Thank you. You were good. Um, Should we pray? Can we do that? Okay. Dear God, thank you for Jesus and his life and his love. Help us to remember that his dying and his rising again have washed our naughtiness away. Help us to be people of love. In your name we pray. Amen. You are good prayers. Good. Okay, so I need Lucy and Deva to stay up here. 
Any other third grader here today? Okay, the rest of you can go back to your seats. Make sure you cheer loudly for the Broncos when you go home, because they need it. Yeah, and let's, uh, let's give a couple Bibles away. Uh, so Deva's mama and uh, mom and daddy, mama and Lucy's mom and daddy, come on up, because we want to give you Bibles to give your children, so. So, uh, when you were baptized, when you were itty bitty, um, your mom, moms and your dads made promises for you, and one of the promises was that they would put in your hands the Holy Scriptures, which is the Bible, and they would put the that uh, they would put the Bible in your hands so that you could learn uh, the love of God through the Word of God. And so this congregation, every Reformation Sunday, we give parents Bibles to give to their babies, their third grade babies, so that you can uh, live the love of God through God's word, okay? So uh, we, wanna, we wanna give you Bibles today, Melissa and Kristen and Brian. Um, we are, uh, we believe in you, we love you, and we want you to know how much you mean to us and how much we want you to learn from us about God's love, okay? Should we pray? Why don't you come over here and we'll pray. Come on over there, and kneel, and let's put our hands on the Bible and let's bless these Bibles, okay? Holy God, uh, we thank you for your amazing and powerful word. Bless these uh, young people, Lucy and Deva, as they receive these Bibles. Help them to love your word and to live your word and to become the strongest and most faithful Christian women they can be. And bless their families as their families support their Christian journey. I entrust these little women to your care and ask you to embrace them in love this day. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, congratulations. Read, read, read. Okay, what's next? Gospel. No, uh, second reading. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Paul's words stand at the heart of the preaching of Martin Luther and the other Reformation leaders. No human beings make themselves right with God through works of the law. We are brought into a right relationship with God through the divine activity centered in Christ's death. This act is a gift of grace which liberates us from sin and empowers our faith in Jesus Christ. Our second reading this morning is from Romans 3, verses 19 through 28. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. God this, did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. 
Then what becomes of boasting? Is it, it is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. If you are able, I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 8th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Word of God, words of grace and freedom. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. I invite you to be seated. In 1941, Franklin D. Roosevelt explored questions about freedom. What does freedom really mean in our daily lives? What does freedom mean in the lives of others? And what does freedom require of us? Roosevelt, a master communicator, a frequent contributor to Liberty Magazine, delivered a State of the Union address to millions of Americans as they gathered around radios and parlors and tenements, just as they had for his famous fireside chats. In his familiar, reassuring voice, he introduced the nation to a concept called the Four Freedoms. Freedom of speech and expression, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. He laid the foundation for American freedom as the country was reeling from the depression and from war. While I appreciate his suppositions, I am reminded he was an historian and politician and not a theologian. But theologian or not, Roosevelt's four freedoms undergird what we believe in the US about freedom today. Freedom for many of us is a very personal thing. Something that enforces an understanding that our life belongs to us to do with as we please. Maybe in material terms, we like the idea that our wealth allows us to buy what we want. Freedom means our time allows us to do what we want. Freedom means that who I am and what I do with my life is up to me. Unfortunately, these suggestions about freedom come up short of the spiritual condition that Jesus speaks of in today's gospel lesson. We can live freedom as citizens of the United States and still be enslaved. Jesus himself suggests that everyone who commits sin, who is naughty, (laughs) is a slave to sin, and so is not really free. While we claim to be free, as citizens of a great nation, we are truly not liberated and free until we understand that our true freedom comes from what God in Christ has done for us through Christ's death on the cross. It is his dying and his rising that offers us the ultimate freedom from what truly enslaves us, our own sinfulness and our own self-absorption. Dietrich Bonhoeffer speaks to this when he reiterated Luther's own theology, a uh, a, a theology that Bonhoeffer loved, And he did this in a letter he wrote to his friend, Eberhard Betke. 
Bonhoeffer writes, it is a question of the freedom of God which finds its strongest evidence precisely in that God freely chose to be bound to historical human beings and to be placed at the disposal of human beings. God is free, not from human beings, but for them. Christ is God's word of freedom. Bonhoeffer understood that freedom is not only from something, enslavement to sin, but freedom is for something as well. As Christians, we talk about freedom from sin, which is the truth of the gospel. But what is also true is the freedom of the church and of Christians everywhere to stand in solidarity with the oppressed and the hungry and the downtrodden and the marginalized. In today's gospel reading from John, Jesus makes a threefold claim. If you continue in my word, then one, you are truly my disciples. Two, you will know the truth. And three, the truth will set you free. He spoke this claim to Jews who had believed in him. That's past tense. According to John chapter 8, many among Jesus' Jewish audience came to believe in him. But the conversation that follows indicates that their belief in Jesus was short-lived. Jesus uses their example of lapsed faith to assert that true disciples continue in his word. And continuing in Jesus' word meant that they would remain committed to and foster their relationship with God above all else. One wonders in this day and age of the self-made man or woman what the gospel promise of freedom in Christ can possibly offer. In a culture that constructs freedom as independence, independence from responsibility or even regulation, taxation, independence from relational obligation, from morality and even mortality, how can we speak of the mutual dependence that Christian freedom describes? That mutual dependence of being freed from in order to be freed for service to humankind. Luther once declared that as Christians we are simultaneously free from all things and yet bound in service to all persons, committed to their well-being, and advancement. According to John, freedom doesn't mean one can do whatever they darn well please. That mindset of independence and autonomy that is informed by our cultural understanding of what it means to be free. Rather, freedom means to be bound to a relationship with God. Living for oneself just doesn't cut it in the kingdom. Not long ago, Mark and I checked out a film from the Evergreen Library entitled The Flight. We think any film starring Denzel Washington is worth our time. In the film, Denzel Washington is an airline pilot with a pretty serious drinking and drug problem. The night before he was charged with transporting passengers from one city to another, he had quite a night of partying, women and drugs and drinking that carried over into the early hours of the morning. So he would use cocaine to counteract the effects of the alcohol, meaning that he was either always high or he was drunk. He was an addict, which in and of itself is not a sin. It is instead a disease that causes deep darkness in one's soul. Denzel's problem was that his addiction caused him to become the consummate liar. He lied so much, he didn't even know what the truth was anymore. One deception led to another. One lie was to cover up another and another and another. 
In the early moments of the movie, Denzel, high and drunk, actually performed heroics when piloting a plane that was having mechanical difficulties. His heroics saved almost all the people on his flight. It wasn't until the end of the movie that he was found out. He was convicted of piloting the plane, even though he saved all these people, piloting a plane that crashed while drunk and high, which resulted in him being sent to jail for manslaughter. If you or I have an addiction to something, be it our work or food or drugs or accolades or alcohol, <coughs> then we can easily relate to being enslaved to powers that are way beyond our ability to master. But addictions are not the only thing that we are enslaved by. Quite simply, anything that creates an estrangement from God and each other, anything contrary to the law of love, enslaves us to darkness and sin. <coughs> Excuse me. In the final scene of the movie, the pilot's son, who in earlier scenes in the movie wanted nothing to do with Denzel, finally visited his father in jail. Denzel, a man transformed and an addict on the road to recovery. Though imprisoned for manslaughter, it was the first time that Denzel felt truly free. No longer hiding, no longer living a lie, no longer deeply enslaved to an addiction that caused him to fall short and sin, he finally felt free for the first time in his adult life. The addiction caused his incarceration, caused him to lose his physical freedom, <coughs> his conviction and ultimate imprisonment, and the grace of God saved his soul and set him free. For the first time in his life, he began to live for others. That's true freedom, isn't it? the privilege to live for others, not bound by the darkness of sin in this world, but bound by the light of Christ, which propels us to a life of service and love. My friends, we are truly free. <clears throat> May we use our God, excuse me, God-given freedom to liberate, liberate others, to fight for justice for all, and to love and serve those around you. To love and to serve those in deep need. What a gift that we are free from sin to live for others. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'm not praying because I can't talk. So, let's sing 517. Please stand. Oh, <coughs> oh wait. We're not singing. We're not standing. You're playing. <laughs> so uh, now I can talk one second. So what we want to do is use this time to reflect on the word, reflect on your freedom, and listen to this gifted woman that will play for us. <laughs>
For our prayers today, each petition concludes with, Lord, in your mercy, to which the congregation will respond, hear our prayer. Knowing the one in whom we trust, and with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all in need. God, our refuge and strength, you make all things new. Reform your church so that our life together bears witness to, our, to your unmerited love. Free us from sin and write the law of love on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Reform our relationships with you, with one another, and with all creation. Restore this good earth the home you entrust to our care. Enrich soils, cleanse waters, and purify the air. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bring an end to war and to the violence that shakes the nations and worries your people. When voices of fear threaten to overwhelm us, fill the earth with your peace and strength. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be the present help of those suffering the tumult of illness, poverty, abandonment, and uncertainty. Bring your calm and healing to those in need. We pray especially for those listed on our prayer list and for Kim. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In this community, O oh Lord, we are all saint sinners and saints. In our dealings with one another and in our witness in the world, help us to trust in your mercy, freely offering others what you give us. Lord, in your mercy. We ask this day, O oh God, that you would uh, provide peace and comfort for both Lana and the Hewitt family. Wrap your arms around all of them that they may know your love and your grace, your forgiveness and healing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We remember before you those who have died in Christ and now live in the fullness of salvation. We trust your presence now, even as we wait for your glory to be revealed. Lord, in your mercy. Trusting and delighting in you, we commend all our lives into your loving hands. We offer these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our freedom, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. Hey, I can do this. receive our morning offering.
invite you to stand. Page four, you will find our offertory. Please sing as the gifts are brought forward. Let us pray. O oh God of love, you have called us to be your church, the body of Christ in the world. We thank you for opportunities to grow in our understanding and concern for one another. May our congregation be an incarnation of your love, and may these gifts offered to you today bring about the growth of your kingdom and the deepening of the world's faith in you. We pray this through Christ our Lord, your amazing grace. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and grace. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us this holy day in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Page five, let's sing together. <clears throat> gifts of God, for the children of God, the meal of grace, the meal of freedom. I invite you all to the table this day. Uh, you may be seated. The ushers will direct you.
On page six, you will find the blessing and the post-communion prayer. After the post-communion prayer, I'd like for us to sing one verse of the church's one foundation, and that's hymn number 654. But we'll do a couple of things before we get to that. I invite you to stand. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen each one of us and keep us in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we see your glory in the face of Jesus. May, may we, we who have, have been guests at this table, table Reflect Christ's life of grace, peace, mercy, and forgiveness, that all the world may know his power to change and to save. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I think I said we'd sing first, didn't I? Yes. No? Okay, I'm blessing. I'm blessing, and then we're singing. One verse, and then we'll all head out to, if you're willing, out to uh, the fire circle to bless it and consecrate it and then come back in for snacks. Okay? All righty. Uh, okay, are we singing or I'm blessing? blessing? I'm blessing. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you deep peace and heart's full of freedom this day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, sing. One verse. interested in joining